Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Go ahead and clap for the Lord one more time. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to be here today. Good to see everybody. It's a wonderful day to serve the Lord. Amen. It's, um, we want to say a special welcome to all the visitors. We're glad you're here today. We're glad that you uh, made it to the house of God on this, this wonderful beginning of the new year. Um, and I just want to tell you, I know some of you have never been here before, but I'm, I'm just going to tell you, you can, you can take your religious cloak off. Amen. We, we just a church that love people. Amen. We ain't nobody tripping. There's no fake phony jokers here. Amen. Including from behind the pulpit. As a matter of fact, I'm getting ready to show you how phony and unfake we are. I'm going to tell a joke. I know that's against some people's religion. They ain't never. Man, who tells jokes behind the pulpit? Me. Amen. All right. So let me, let me start it off. All right. So, um, you know, and, and everybody grew up. Well, most people grew up with the yo mama jokes. Right. All right. So the joke goes like this. Your mama's so greedy, she goes to KFC and licks other people's fingers. <laughs> you know the slogan for KFC is finger licking good? Some, some of y'all, all right. All right, man, let me, let me go ahead and get into the word. Hey, man, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Um, it's a blessing that everybody's here. And um, did everybody participate in the fast? If you did, just go ahead and clap for the Lord. <laughs> hey, man, these are one of the things that Jesus told us to do. He said that we should fast as well as we should pray. So that's a blessing. And um, I know some people never, maybe never have been on the fast. It's your first experience with it. But it's something that, that the Lord definitely wants us to do. But, um, but it's wonderful. We started a discipleship group. We started Wednesday night Bible study at 6 o'clock. So if you, um, during the middle of the week, you know, just come on down and um, come get something from the Lord. You say, well, preach, it's too cold out there. It, isn't, it ain't cold in here, is it? Man, it was hot. I walked in there. I'm like, man. <laughs> Somebody turn off the heat. So we're trying to just adjust and figure things out as far as the, the temperature is concerned. I, it's, so we just, just bear with us. Um, if it was up to me, I'd just wait till everybody came and then the, the bodies would warm up the building. But that's all right. Everybody's different. Amen. So, yeah. But it's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord. Going back to James chapter 5. Um, we, we're going to be wrapping up James here pretty soon because we're getting ready to start the, um, the church-wide study. So we're going to be wrapping up James pretty soon, but we're going to continue on with James chapter 5. Um, and this week was, is a little bit different of a message. Um, it's sometimes when you walk through the scriptures and do these expository messages, there's no, you can't make it cute. It is what it is. Amen? And, and some people know what I'm talking about. You know, you, you, some things you can't make cute. You, I know somebody one time, they went to the pound and they got a dog. And this dog was so ugly, man. The thing had one. The thing was like cockeyed. It had one, one tooth. It was limping. And, 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 um, and you know, they loved it. And they put a bow on the dog. I'm like, you can try to make that dude cute all you want to. It just, it just ain't going to happen. Amen? <laughs> all right. Amen. But anyway, yeah, so there's no cute ways to dress this up. You just have it. It is what it is. Amen? All right. So, um, so just having said that, we're going to go to James chapter 5. Chapter 5. And um, just remember that here in James chapter 5, again, there's a kind of a pitch, and it, it kind of goes up and down. And again, the, the, um, the New Testament version of Proverbs, so he'll start a thought, complete a thought, move on to something else, start a subject, complete a subject, move on to something else. So the subject that he's talking about today is on the subject along the lines of patience, which some of y'all don't have. Amen. And what some of us are working on, I'm not saying I'm, I'm there. Amen. A lot of time behind the pulpit, these people act like they already have arrived. You ain't arrived. You get impatient, too, especially nowadays in the world that we live in. Everything's quick. Everything's fast. Everything's in a hurry. And you order door dash, and you're waiting on the food, and you're getting impatient. Where my food at? It's taking them too long. And then you get it, and the fries are cold. You say, preach, I've never ordered door dash, so I don't know what it's like, but i just rather get it myself. But if you do it, hey, that's your thing. If you're balling like that, hey, go ahead and do what you do. But, um, but people are impatient now. And, um, you know, the Bible wants us as believers to be patient. Amen. Patient with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen. Realizing that some of us are on different spiritual paths. Not different paths per se, but we're in different levels of growth as far as spirituality is concerned. 
Some people have been in the faith a long time, amen? And, they, and they're more seasoned, and they know different things, and they know Scripture, and, and they know the different, um, the different nuances in Scripture and, and the Bible and how it works and how things, Scripture goes together, and, you know, you can't just pull one Scripture here and make a doctrine out of that. They know all of that. But some new believers don't, and they have to be taught. They have to learn that, you know, maybe, I'm just going to be honest with you, maybe you came from a jacked-up church, and, and, and they, they take scriptures out of context, and they create all these false, erroneous doctrines that have no biblical foundation, like women um, aren't supposed to wear pants, or if you wear earrings and makeup, you lost, you ain't saved. That's a lie. That's not biblical. Amen. I dare anybody to challenge me on that. I'll open up the Bible and tear you apart. That's not a biblical doctrine. Amen. Amen. And see, these are the things that hold people in, in, in captivity. And then when they go to a church where people are, are real and, and, and they follow the Bible, it's something foreign to them. It's something strange to them. So, you know, it's our desire to teach people the word of God. It, it, it's, not, it's nothing to do with what I say. God's word is true. Every man is a liar. So again, patience is what James is dealing with. So learning about patience, learning some things about the word of God, knowing that patience is something that you should not pray for. Now, if you never heard that, it may be a new one for you. But I'm just going to tell you, you should never pray for patience. Early in my Christianity, I was going through a lot of stuff. And I sat down with my pastor and I was like, I don't know what's going on, man. I, I'm going through all these things. All this stuff is just coming out of nowhere. And he said it just this plain. You prayed for patience, didn't you? And I was like, how'd you know? He's a prophet, Lord. No, he, he just knows that because the Bible tells us in Romans, I think it's around Romans chapter 5, that if you, um, patience, tribulation is what works patience. So if you pray for patience, what you're asking God to do is bring tribulation in my life because tribulation is going to work that patience. So you don't want to pray for that. You ever heard the saying, be careful what you ask for, be careful what you pray? You just may get it. <laughs> Amen. So the thing is that that's something that you don't want to pray for. God will give you what you need according to what you need. And that's the way you should pray. God, give to me as I have need to help me to grow and to be what you designed and called me to be. So don't pray for patience. And if you want to, go ahead. But I'm going to tell you what to expect. Expect trials. Expect tribulations. Expect people to get on your nerves. Expect being sick. Because these things are what work patience. So please, and if you want to do it again, that's on you. But when, when it happens and you get it, then, then you got it. All right, so having said all of that, let's pray. Father, right now, we just thank you. We thank you for your people. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for each one that's here today, God. We know that you have a special word for each and every one of us. We just pray that you would do something special in the lives of your people today. God, this is a new day, a new day to worship you, a new day to honor you, a new day to see what you would desire for us to be. God, we just pray that we're willing to be made willing to do the things that you ask us to do. Do a special work that will last throughout eternity. We love you, we honor you, and we praise you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so James chapter 5. Patience. And um, I just title this, I always try to have a catchy title. Some of y'all know. Um, I title this, Just Wait. You know, there used to be an old song that said that you can't hurry God. You just have to wait. <laughs> and that's something that, as a believer, you, you start seeing. God doesn't work on your timetable. And I know sometimes we, we, we need things, we want things, and we, if it doesn't happen at this particular time, then all is lost. But God doesn't work on your timetable. Amen. God has all eternity to fulfill his promises to us. And that's a long time. Amen. All right. So talking about patience, I'm going to read um, James chapter five, verse seven. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. 
See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. This is an excellent place to, to start. Um, understanding that James here is talking to believers. Now, he talks about, he says, brothers. He's talking to brothers and sisters. Now, I'm glad that this is here because that, that's something I want to I address the congregation about. San Jacinto is a small community, right? Amen. Some of y'all come from Los Angeles, you come from San Diego, you come from, from big cities and big communities. San Diego is, I'm not San Diego, San Jacinto is a small, and I, I'm still trying to figure out how, how you pronounce it. Is it San Jacinto, San Jacinto, San Jacinto? I've heard all of it, amen. I, I just say San Jacinto, amen. I, I can't put the, the roll on it, you know, if you, if you speak Spanish and you can put the little roll on it, I can't do that. Amen. But anyway, San Jacinto. So this is a small community. So if we're brothers and sisters in the Lord, if you see me at Walmart, don't act like you don't know who I am. <laughs> Amen. Amen. They used to be an old saying in Mobile, um, holla at me. Because you know you know me. It bothers me when you call yourself my brother and sister in the Lord and I see you in public and you act like you don't know who I am. That's a problem. You're my sister. You're my brother. Amen? Amen. And I know who you are. And I, you know, I, I spoke to folks and they turned their head. What, what's up with that? Are you my brother or not? Are you my sister or not? And I'm just going to be honest with you. Usually when I go to the store, especially Walmart, I'm in and out. And I know I get it, ladies. You may, you may have your, your, your um, I don't know, your bonnet on or doing your... <laughs> That's always a step. I, I get it. But, man, I've seen a bonnet before. I, I got a wife. Amen. She don't walk around with, with, her, with her, her makeup on all day. I understand. So you don't have to act like you don't know who I am. Do you act like you don't know your brothers and sisters when you go somewhere? Am I, am I, being, am I okay, Jeff? If I see you in public, don't act like you don't know me. I know you. Now, maybe you got some stuff in your basket that you don't want me to see. Uh, you, and that's okay. Hey, Amen. I ain't trying to judge you like that. Again, understand something, y'all. The life that you live, you live it unto the Lord. And if you can't do something in public and see a person and you're embarrassed about what you've done, guess what? God is everywhere. God is at all places at all times. He knows everything you're doing. He knows who's on your phone. He knows what you look at. He knows your Instagram account. He knows what's in your grocery basket. He knows how much money you make. God knows everything. And saying that, let me make something completely, totally, and honestly clear with you. Some of y'all need to learn how to pray. You going to God with all this, this, this uh, mumbo jumbo and all this stupid talking, and, and because you've seen that, religious hypocrisy, and even Jesus said it. He said, when you go to the Lord and when you go to God in prayer, don't be like the hypocrites, using all these flowery words and, and saying a bunch of nothing. Amen. You ever talk to somebody and they say a bunch of nothing? And you'd be like, bro, cut to the chase. What are you trying to tell me? If my breath stinks, just let me know. Hey, you need a mint. So, something. Don't sit there and talk around the subject. You ain't going to hurt my feelings. Amen. Brothers and sisters. Don't act like you don't know your brother and sister. That's not cool to me. And we're going to spend eternity together. And again, I get it. Maybe you're embarrassed about what's in your car, but I'm not looking at that. I just want to say hi to you. Pronounce a blessing on you. Amen. And I'm not trying to say I'm all that, that I can pronounce blessings on people. You know you have the ability and power to pronounce blessings on people too. Do you know that? When you see people, you can say, be blessed in the name of the Lord. And, and your words have power. Most believers don't even understand how powerful that their words are. Your words are powerful. So when you talk to your children, always say good things. Don't call them stupid. 
even though they do stupid things. I get it. You know, and we all have done stupid things. But the thing that you did is stupid. Don't call the person stupid. Amen. There's a difference. Your words have power. So as a believer, understand the power in your words. You do have the power to pronounce a blessing and also a curse on people. So don't be cursing folks. And I ain't talking about the four-letter words either. I'm talking about saying things like, I hope they, you know what you be saying to folks. <laughs> he think he all that, driving that Mercedes. I hope it blow up. <laughs> Why would you hope that on somebody? And I, hey, if you got a Benz, that's cool. That's a blessing. You balling if you got a Benz, because I'm telling you, man, them, them, my wife had a Benz for a little while. And I took it to get the oil changed. <laughs> they told me that the car needs a software update. I'm like, I, that's for computers, right? <laughs> they were like, no, your car needs a software update. I said, well, how much is that going to cost? Oh, it's $2,500. He acted like it was $5. I said, bro, that's money. That, 20, I ain't got no $2,500 for no software update. I said, oh, we got to get rid of this car. Personally, I don't like to drive nothing I can't work on. Amen? If I can't pick up the hood and, 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 and take the battery off, I know sometimes, one time a person had a car and the battery was under the tire. I said, no. Nah. I said, you can, you can keep that. Because sometime in life you have to do what you got to do. And you don't have the money to pay people. Can somebody say Amen. Amen. When you don't have the money to, t and the cleaners are getting more and more expensive, man. They want $12, $15 to iron some pants. I said, I could do that myself. <laughs> Amen. As a matter of fact, one of the best things I've seen, I don't know if somebody invented this, but they make a suit now that's washable. I said, praise God, where has this been all my life? Amen. <laughs> but now I finally got one. I got a few of them, Jeff. I bought several of them. Because you, but anyway, what did that, that has nothing to do with it. But anyway, yeah. But James was talking to brothers and sisters here. So I'm saying all that to say this. If I'm your brother, if you call me your sister, your brother in the Lord, hey, treat me like it. Because I'll treat you that way. Amen? All right. So patience. In James chapter 5, verse 7, he talked about that. Brothers and sisters. He said, let it have he said, be patient, therefore, I'm glad they got it on the thing. Um, therefore, be patient, brother, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Waiting patiently for it receives an early or latter rain. Amen. Now, the first thing that patience teaches us, that's some thing that patience teach, teaches you, all right? Patience teaches me. I'm not in control all the time. Patience teaches me that I'm not in control all the time. Now, trust me, I get it. People want to be in control. I like being in control of stuff, especially driving. I just, I just don't trust a lot of people's driving. I'm just going to be honest with you because I was a professional driver for many years. But I'll sit in the car and, and grab the size, and my wife don't trust my driving, but I trust my driving. Amen. But anyway, yeah. So um, it says, Pati let patience have its perfect work in you. But there's some things in life that are unchanged. When I think about what he talked about, he talked about the farmer. The farmer waits. He can't control what seeds grow and what seeds don't grow. And every year they go out there, Dorothy, with the expectation that when I plant a crop, there's some fruit or whatever that I plant is going to grow. So there's an expectation. So waiting patiently, understanding that you're not in control of everything. Some things you just, you just got to wait on. Not too long ago, I was at the ATM. And um, I, I make bank deposits through the ATM. And, and I was there, and, and evidently this guy was in a hurry. The guy rolled down his window and started literally yelling at me and cursing at me because he felt like I was taking too long. I rolled down the window down politely, stuck my head. And, you know, sometimes people don't say none of these folks. I'll say something to you. I mean, you get mad. I'm just, I didn't curse at him. I didn't raise my voice. I said, man, I, I have to wait. I can only go when the thing, well, hurry up then. And I just, whatever, just knucklehead. 
I just said, I can, I can only go until, I can't go until, until it's finished. So I said, you just got to wait. And he got mad. I don't, I don't know what to tell him. But we live in a society where people think that everything in, works by the beat of their drum. And when they say something, it should happen. In, re, in reality, things don't work that way. And what James is dealing with here is the understood fact that as a believer, Jesus is coming back. If you're not a believer, he's coming back. Whether you're ready or not, he's coming back. Whether you see your brother in Walmart, don't speak to him because you got something in your basket that you should. He's still coming back. Whether you're ready or not, Jesus is coming back. So what he's telling you to do is you have to wait patiently. And if you're a true believer, there's been some times in your life where you look at the circumstances, you look at the world, you know, because things aren't like they used to be. Amen. Things have changed a lot. People have gotten more jacked up. People have bad attitudes. People don't want to do the right thing. Everybody's so selfish, just like the Bible says. He said in the last days, perilous times shall occur. People will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. And that's how people are nowadays. It's about me. Go to church for what? I got to get some rest. Rest in the Lord. <laughs> last time I checked, when you come here, I, I don't see nobody working. It ain't like you got to come here and shovel um manure or, 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 or cut the grass or nothing like that, you chilling. I'm working, <laughs> amen, but that's all right. I don't mind, amen. So the thing is, is that he's saying be patient. Patience teaches you that all things are not in your control. Some things you just have to leave in the hands of the Lord. Some people, some of you are walking around and you don't have patience for your children. You're wondering about their future. You're wondering about what's going to happen next. You're wondering how things are going to get together. Guess what? You can think and worry and all that kind of stuff. Worry helps nothing. You just have to wait and see. But as long as you've done what you need to do as a parent, amen, as long as you pray for them, as long as you teach them the word, amen, as long as you be an example before them. Yeah, you can't, yeah, that's okay to clap, because guess what? They don't see what you say. They look at how you live. When you're always talking about God, trying to push the Bible down their throat, and you don't even go to church yourself. I'm just telling you. Now, you can do what you want. <laughs> Not good. I know they need to know. They need to hear it. But there's something about the power of somebody who actually does it. See, you can't tell me about um, um, barbecue because I know how to barbecue. You can tell me all you want to. Amen. But when you boil your ribs and then try to throw them on there for five seconds so they can taste like charcoal, <laughs> bro, don't come to me talking about no barbecue. <laughs> Amen. And then they ask you, what you think about my ribs? You boiled them. <laughs> and then you sauce them up, put all kind of sauce so you can hide the flavor. Tammy, you know what I'm talking about. Not saying you do that, Tammy. I'm saying you know what I'm talking about. You got to make sure you're good now because people get mad at you. Or you go somewhere. You ever been to a barbecue and, and people be cooking? <laughs> And they don't know how to start a fire, and they dump all this lighter fluid, and you get a burger, and the burger tastes like lighter fluid. And then they ask you how it tastes. It tastes like Kingsford. <laughs> Amen. All right. So patience teaches you that you're not in control. And thinking about all that, just thinking about barbecuing, when you cook a certain type of meat, it takes time. Some of y'all ever cooked a, a, a pork butt or a pork shoulder? When you put it in there, it takes at least 12 hours to make pulled pork. At least 12. 
Amen. So you have to wait. You can't speed up that process. If you turn the fire a little more, you're going to burn it. Amen. And you know what? God is the ultimate in getting believers to where they need to be. He's not going to push you too fast. He's not going to pull back too much. He knows just the right amount of pressure to put in your life where you can look to him. Amen. And some of you, God has put some pressure on your life. That's why you're here today. And that's okay. Amen. Because he can do that. And he knows how to get you exactly where you need to be so you can get things in order. Y'all go to Matthew, please. Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 39. Uh Uh-oh. Matthew 24. Y'all ain't got a cue on the thing? Matthew 24, verses 36 through 39, talking about patience teaching me that I'm not in control all the time. Okay. Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. Stop right there. Do you guys know there have been religions that have predicted the coming of Christ? And the crazy thing, Floyd, is I don't know how people still go there. In 1972, they said, Jesus is coming back. Sell all your stuff and get things ready because the Lord is coming. I saw it and the prophet has predicted it. Guess what? He didn't come back. 1976. They came out with another prophecy. Oops, saith the Lord. <laughs> Jesus is coming back now. Now you can sell, but I already sold my stuff. And I think, just think if you were silly enough to sell your stuff. I don't want to say silly because some people were just straight up misled. But let me tell you guys something. Don't trust a person more than you trust God's word. These people went out there and sold all their stuff and got rid of their land and mortgaged their house and did all that kind of stuff for a lie. Didn't happen. 1978. Now, see, see, this is what gets me, Charles, is that people still go to these churches. How? Same thing happened. Didn't come back. How are they still allowed to function? And if I I look around, most of us in here are are black. You know some of these religions wouldn't even let you come into their assembly? How do you go to their church? So if they believe that then, the leadership still believes that, because some of them are from the old school. How do you go there? And you wouldn't have been accepted. And there's several of them. Ask me after church. I'll tell you exactly who they are. Now, if you want to go, go. I'm not going to do it because of YouTube and stuff. They may take us down or whatever. But I'm just going to tell you straight up. Yeah. You black, you wouldn't have been accepted. How do black people still go to something like that? Jesus himself said, go back to Matthew, y'all. Don't, 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 don't cut me off here. Jesus himself said that nobody knows. Not even the angels of heaven. He said, only my father alone knows. So that means to tell me again, another jacked up, stupid, erroneous, messed up doctrine in churches that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the father are all one person. He just said, nobody knows. Not even the angels, only my father. So that means he don't know either. So my question to you is, if him and and the father are the same person, he just lied. Believe what you want. (laughs) And there's many, 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 many scriptures to prove that the Trinity is real. And I've had people say, oh, the word Trinity ain't in the Bible. Okay, cocaine's not in there either. Does that mean you can smoke it and, and snort it? Knowing the doctrines of the Bible. 
Guys, go back to Matthew chapter 24. Y'all, y'all, y'all leave me hanging here. Matthew 24, verse 36. All right. Verse 27. I mean, 37. But as in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Verse 39. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So in other words, what he's saying is that people were just going about life as usual. Nobody was prepared. Nobody was ready. Nobody had their stuff put together. And the flood came. And everybody died. One thing about God is God will always give you a warning before judgment. All you got to do is read the Bible. He's always done it. Before judgment comes, there's always some type of warning from the true believers. The true believers will always know what's happening. And it was the same way in the days of Noah. You think about that. Jesus is coming back. Again, whether you're ready or not, he's coming back. And the wonderful thing about the fact that he's coming back, you have to always keep yourself ready. I remember I heard a statement from my grandmother years when I was a kid. She said, baby, you should live every day like it's your last day because you never know when either God's going to call you home. As a matter of fact, well, let me just put it in plain terms. Are you going to die? Amen. Or the Lord was going to return. You just don't know. So your life has to be in order. And again, God is everywhere. So we have to make sure that we do what's right. But patience teaches me I'm not in control. All right, um, the second point here, we're talking about patience. Patience teaches me how God is long-suffering. So the thing is, is that you know that God, and and I'm just going to be honest with you, I don't know about you, but God has really, really, really been long-suffering with me. Man, I've done it, I've messed up stuff and and, and botched things and didn't do things right and wasn't in order and and messed up all kind of junk. God still had patience with me. Amen? Amen. I I know I got saved at a young age, but but the reality is, is that God just let me go through my crazy stage and he was patiently waiting. I'm just going to keep dealing with him and keep dealing with him and keep dealing with him. But the same at the same token, I didn't know. And I could have died many, many times. It's grace that we're here. It's grace that God has given people one more chance to pray. Amen. So don't take this as a light thing. If you're in church today, it's because God has allowed you to be here. It's because God has blessed you. It's because God has made a way. And you should not count that as a light thing. Again, going back to the flood, going back to Noah. See, most people don't even know that Noah was a preacher. The Bible said Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and for 120 years, Noah spent building that ark. And every day, people walked by the ark, and they saw the ark. Oh, that's just old crazy Noah. He don't know what he's talking about. Amen. He's old crazy Noah, and him and his crazy sons, they building the ark. And I can imagine, after the work was done, after the timber had been cut, after the pitch was laid out, Noah put up his pulpit, and he started preaching to the people, it's going to rain. You know, people didn't even know what rain was. Do y'all know that? There was no such thing as rain before the flood happened. Because God would do, let, the, let the dew or something water the earth or something like that. But there, there was no such thing as rain. And people thought he was crazy. And they just continued to live their lives and all of those things. See, if it was me, I'm just, I don't know. And I can't see, you can't say if you was in a position. But man, when I would have saw all them animals walking it out and say, hey, man, uh, oh, man, no, it must be right about something. <laughs> man. <laughs> Look at all them animals going. See, that's, you know, seeing is believing. Amen? 
I know I used to always hear people talking about God, but there were certain things that I saw that made me know that God is real. And when I saw it and I saw their lives and I saw things happen, I said, you know what? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, God is real. And I've asked God for things as a kid. And he would make things happen. And I knew it was him. But Noah preached for 120 years, and then people heard the message. And I think about nowadays, it's a shame that people can go on the Internet and look up everything. But some of them, I see sometimes when preachers preach, and you look at how many people watch, 30 people. A good biblical message. See, people don't want to hear that. Tell me something that's going to ruffle my feathers. Let Let me watch Club Shay Shay. I want to hear the dirt. I want to hear the mess. I want to, but you don't want to hear about your soul being saved. Because guess what? Whether you believe it or not, the Bible said that the small and great are going to stand before God and they're going to give an account for everything that they've done on earth. And I'm not saying them about Club Shay Shay. I checked it out myself. Amen. I wanted to see what they were talking about. Amen. So the thing is, is that, but as a believer, understand that someday God is going to hold you accountable for all things. But Noah preached and they thought he was crazy. And all of a sudden, I love what the Bible says. After everything was done, after all the animals went in the ark, it said, God closed the door. The door to your life is still open. Amen. The door has not been closed on you yet. It's still open. And see, Jeff, in my mind, I remember, and I can just think about how many times that I could have been dead. I could have been lost. I could have been messed up. And then once you die, there is no coming back. There is no reincarnation. There is, I don't care what people tell you, you're not coming back again. God closed the door. So guess what? Everybody except Noah and his family died. Can you imagine? I don't think people actually think about this, Orandi, how how it actually happened in the days of Noah. People was trying to get to higher ground. Maybe the rain will stop. I can see little kids, mommy, daddy, it's still raining. It's it's still coming up. Let's go to the roof. And after the roof was covered, they had to swim to a mountain. Let's go to a mountain. Let's go somewhere else. And I'm sure that there was people close to the ark. They said that if you dig up and did an excavation on the ark and you would find on side of the ark where people's fingerprints were trying to claw and open up the side of the boat. Why? Because God said the door was closed. And once God closes the door, there is is no coming back. You know what? You need to stop running. Some of you are running. You've been running a long time. Guess what? God has your number today. When are you going to stop running? Because one day the door of your life is going to be closed. You can't say that he didn't love you. Come on now, you can't say that I didn't have a chance. You can't say, God, I didn't know. You can't say, nobody loved me enough to tell me the truth. You can't say that. I mean, you can, but it'll be a lie. And I always think about this in my mind, how Judgment Day is going to play out. There are going to be some people up there trying to lie to the Lord. Well, God, that wasn't me. That was... That was my cousin up in there, and you know, I, I just had a different hairstyle that day, and, and you know, Lord, you know, I, I done some good stuff. I fed the poor and did all that, and I, he gonna be like, I don't know you, man. Because the Bible said that's what God's gonna say to people. Now, some of you may know about God. You know who God is, but he don't know you. How many of y'all know who Michael Jordan is? You probably got on his tennis shoes. Everybody in here knows who Michael Jordan is, right? Amen. But guess what? Michael Jordan don't know you. (laughs) And it's going to be the same way. But Lord, I did stuff in your name and I did all these things. And he's going to say, I don't know you. I don't. But I know you, Lord. Patience teaches us how God is long-suffering. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. 
go to it, please, if y'all would. No, 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 just stay at James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 8. But had that one queued up. Amen. James chapter 5, okay. James chapter 5, verse 8. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Or in other words, get yourself ready. And that's the thing. Some of you are young right now. See, God wants you when you're young. Especially when he has a calling in your life. That's why some of you get so bothered by the message and you so, so like, man, I need to change my life because God has something for you to do. And he's trying to, now, don't get me wrong, he can use people when they get older, but he wants you while you're young. Amen. Why you can still get out there and tell people when you still have some fire in your bones when you can still get up there and, 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 and talk and, 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 and you get excited because that's something about, about youth excitement is different from old people excitement. Amen. And trust me, I get up here and it's, but hey, I'm, I'm over the hill, y'all. I'm, I'm over 50. Trust me, when I get home, every time I scream, I feel it. And I'd be like, Lord, I need to go to sleep. I'm, my head hurt after <laughs> After church, I'd be like, Lord, I need to lay down somewhere. <laughs> but God wants you while you're young, when you can still be effective. Amen? And again, I'm not saying that you can't be effective when you're older, but God wants you while you're young. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. That's love. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there, are, there be prophecy, they will fa fail. Whether there are tongues, they shall cease. Whether there is knowledge, it shall vanish away. Love. God teaches me. I'm sorry. Patience teaches me how God is long-suffering. You know, and all those things we just talked about, love, understand something about God. God does not just love people. God is love. If you sit down and just think about that, it's powerful because people think, oh, God, God loves everybody. Still. No, God is love. God's not going to do you wrong. Amen? Amen. You can trust your life with God. And see, that's the thing. Most people think that they have to do it all themselves. I have to get my career in order. I have to get all the things in, in, in. I have to make sure I marry the right person. I have to make sure I do everything right. But the Bible tells us that God is love. God loves you. See, you think you love yourself, but God loves you more than you love yourself. I guarantee you, now one of y'all can tell me how many hairs are on your head. But God cares so much about you, he numbered the hairs on your head. And I know I lost a few today, especially back here. Amen. But that's all right. But love, God loves us. Patience teaches me how God is long suffering. He said, Love bears all things, or believes all things. And then verse 8, he was talking about certain things and talking about certain aspects. See, you have to be rooted and grounded in what you believe. Because some people aren't. How are you so easily swayed with doctrine when you know the Bible? How are you so easily deceived when somebody comes into your life and they speak outside of that and they don't show you true love? See, the issue is, is that, you know, when a person comes into your life and they try to change everything about you, that means they don't like you for who you are. They like something else that you could be. And I'm like this. I don't know about you, but if you don't like me for who I am, then hey. Peace. Amen. 
And some of you, and I'm not trying to throw no shade on nobody, but man, if you're courting, if you're dating somebody and they're trying to change everything about you, that's a red flag. Because they don't like you. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some, some, some issues and some nuances that can change. Amen. I know when I met my wife, she told me I couldn't put shoes in the kitchen no more. And I understand that. Amen. <laughs> but the thing is that there's some things, you know, and, and, and it's, it's different. A suggestion versus a demand, that's two different things. If you marry me, you're going to have to, to lose 50 pounds. I don't need you then. Now, if I want to do that, that's different. Amen. And that's the thing about God. God doesn't try to change everything about you. He tells you, come as you are. Amen. And that patience, Thomas, is what's going to get you to change. And you know what? That's the thing about love. It talked about God. Love suffers long and is kind. That's all God. You know, God loves you so much that he wants you just as you are. And when you get that same love for him, guess what? That's something that happens as a reciprocation process where you say, I want to be what he wants me to be because I love him and I know that he loves me. But God's not going to try to change everything about you when he first comes into your life. He knows it's going to take time. He knows it's a process. He knows that it's going to be some time before things because he's patient. You don't try to change everything about the person when you meet them. Red flag. But you do what you want. Amen. Patience teaches me how God is long-suffering. All right, the last thing. Patience teaches me how to trust in God. Patience teaches me how to trust in God. Amen. James chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and have seen the, the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Patience teaches me how to trust in God. You know, that's why I believe that God, when we pray for certain things, especially when you're a new believer, God doesn't give you everything you want. Because you need to develop patience in learning how to wait. And again, I think about parenting. When you're a parent, you don't give kids everything they want. If you do, then you're not a very good parent. I'm just going to be honest with you. Because if it was up to kids, they would just eat chicken nuggets and, um, and french fries. Can somebody say amen? amen? And being from the South and growing up in Alabama, you're going to eat them greens. <laughs> so now, see, when you get older, you like them. But as a kid, you didn't. Or you're going to eat them rutabagas. Oh, Lord, I hated them things. Or you're going to eat that broccoli. My mom and them got smart with it because I used to fill my mouth with the stuff and go and spit it out in the toilet. And, um, yeah, they got smart with it. You can see you sit there and you eat it, and we're going to watch you eat it. You don't eat nothing else until you eat that first. Some of these kids, I'm glad they're in there because they'll be mad at me, boy. <laughs> but if you leave it up to kids, they'll self-destruct. You can't give them everything they want. I remember when I was a kid, um, I think I was in the, s the seventh grade when the first pair of Nikes with an air pad came out. They were, called, they were called Revolutions. Some of you might be old enough to remember that. Some of you Nike buffs, Nike fans. I don't wear them no more, but anyway. But yeah, so um, that was the first Nike shoe with an air pad. And man, I wanted them shoes. Guess what they cost? They were $100. And people was like, you got to be crazy to pay $100 for some shoes. But what are folks paying now? Lord, that's cheap nowadays. You, buy, you, you probably can get some pro wings for $100. You <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Most people don't know what they, they are. <laughs> but, but yeah, you probably get some old busted joker for $100, but now you can't get no Jordan for that. But anyway, you know, I, I wanted them shoes so bad. It was like, man, when I got them shoes, I pampered them, and I tried to, tried to make sure they was all nice and stuff like that. But as soon as we played basketball, that went to, um, 
revolutions. They was all dirty and jacked up, and all, no matter how much I tried to clean them, I could never get them back to where they were in the new condition. And the thing that I feared the most was my mama. Because she would be checking. How them shoes holding up? So me, y'all know what I'm talking about. When you had that, had that mama to checks, be looking out the window to see if you took your church clothes off. I know you ain't out there in them church clothes. I ain't mama. You run around the back and change real quick. Amen. You know, it was so bad that I, I, would, I feared my mom more than I feared getting hurt. One time I almost cut my finger off and I was scared to tell him I was scared. My, I was bleeding like a, like a pig. I, I don't know. How, that's what we say. That's a, maybe that's. Anyway, but I was bleeding real bad. It was blood everywhere and I was holding it and I was trying to, man, I, I'm th- I could have died, man. I, it, I had a, a, a washcloth and it was soaked in blood and blood was dripping out because I literally cut the tip of my, you can see, still see the scar. And still to this day, there's no feeling in that finger because the nerve hadn't grown back yet. And that was, man, when I was 13, now I'm 51, and it, it still ain't grown back. But anyway, um, I was holding it, and it was, it was bleeding, and, and, I, and I was afraid. I was scared to tell my mama, but it was bleeding so bad, I had, I had to tell her, and I started getting lightheaded. And I said, Mama, she said, what? I said, I cut myself. Well, go in there and run some water on it and stuff. You know that old home remedies. Put some butter on it. I don't know. <laughs> go dance in the corner and put a penny on the top of the windowsill. They had all kind of crazy stuff anyway. But yeah, she was just like, well, let me see it. And she said, oh, Lord, and ran me to the doctor and stuff. And, and, and yeah, but anyway. But I was more afraid of her <laughs> than I was in, in hurting myself. But yeah. But that's the thing. When you, when you understand that, that God loves you so much, he's not going to give you everything that you immediately ask for. Now, I'm going to tell you the key to getting God's blessings. A lot of times it's not the thing that you're asking for. Make sure you understand this. It's not what you're asking for because God can give it to you. If you believe who God is, he made all things and he owns the cattle on the earth and the fullness thereof. Everything in the universe belongs to God. What is it to him to give you something small? The thing is, is that you're not ready for it. Some of you want spouses. And trust me, I get it, man. I was single for 10 years before before my wife came into my life. Some of you want spouses, but God is not going to give you one because you're not ready. You don't even take care of yourself. How are you going to take care of somebody's daughter? You're not ready. I remember preaching the church told me that. I was like, man, I want to get married and stuff like that. He said, brother, God's not going to give you a wife until you're ready for it. How's your finances look? I was like. Uh, not too good. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and you know, when he told me that, I started getting ready. Ask my wife, man. When, when I got married to her, I had thousands of dollars in the bank. My car, I had no bills at all. The only bill I had was my, uh, was, was my payment for my rent. That was it. My car was paid off, and I ain't dry no bucket either. I had a, 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 a what was it, a, a 1999 um, Buick LeSabre. Yeah, it wasn't a deuce and a quarter, but it was like the newer ones anyway. But yeah, I had a Buick Saber, man. It was nice, had leather seats, all that. My car was paid for, amen. I had everything put together. I had my, my wedding rings. As a matter of fact, this was, one of, this was the wedding ring I bought. She's upgraded because we've been married over 20 years. But the thing is, is that I had my stuff together. So she didn't have nothing to worry about because because I had my stuff together. I was prepared. And a lot of times we ask God for things. God bless me with this. God bless me with a new car. You don't even take care of the one you got. Amen. Amen. God bless me with a husband and you don't even want to cook for yourself. What are you going to eat? Because, brothers, I don't know about y'all, but I like a good home-cooked meal sometime. Amen. And it's okay to go out. It's okay to get Chick-fil-A and, and, and Popeyes and all that kind of stuff. But sometimes I just want a good old-fashioned down-home pot roast and gravy. Come on, now. My wife be like, where you want to go? I am like, home. Because it's cheap. Amen. 
But patience teaches you how to trust in God. Go to Matthew 21, verse 22, y'all. But the thing about patience is, is that patience, there's a way and there's a structure. There's some things that we have to do. God wants you to wait. To get God's blessings, the first thing you have to do is pray. We just came off the fast, and if you wasn't a part of that, amen, we're still going on. You can catch up. Because the focus team, we're going to be fast until the 21st. Amen. Amen. So the thing, when when you're waiting on God, there's three things you need to do. First of all, you need to pray. Make your request, as the Bible says, known unto the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that he's going to give it to you just because you asked. Now, sometimes people get that backwards. Well, I prayed, and and the Bible said that when I pray that he hears me, and he's going to give me whatever I ask. When you ready for it, amen? First of all, you have to pray. The second thing is you have to wait. You pray. How long have you waited? Amen. And then the last thing to me, which is the most important thing, is you have to expect God to do it. A lot of times we pray and we wait but we're not looking for it. When I pray and I ask God for something, I'm looking for it. I mean, there was years ago, I was talking to my wife, I was fixing up my truck and stuff, and I, and I wanted some rims, I wanted some Dayton's. And you say, preach you right? Yeah. <laughs> ain't nothing, what's wrong with that? Show me the sin in that, it's just a car. It ain't my God, amen? Things in the garage. I drove it 33 miles last year. But anyway, I, was, I wanted some rent. My wife was like, we ain't got no money. I said, I know, honey. I said, I'm just going to ask God that he's going to make a way. And you know what? I started looking. See, the thing is, is that y'all pray for stuff, and you just leave it in God's hands. Are you looking? Are you expecting? And guess what? I remember the day when I went to that mailbox, and that check was that jazz. And it was just enough to get my rims. <laughs> and my wife said, you know what? She said, I don't know why I always question you, but it seemed like whenever you ask God for something, he always give it to you. Because I love him. Amen. Because I've done right by him. Because I'm his child and I know it. Amen. Because I know that everything belongs to him. I know if my heart is right. I know if I pray. I know if I do the right thing. I know if I'm expecting him to do it. Guess what? He does it every time. Why? Because he's God. (laughs) There's nothing impossible for the Lord. And I just believe that. When I went to the doctor years ago, they gave me this bad diagnosis and told me I was going to die because of something. I said, you know what? That's what you say. Gave me a bag full of pills. You know what I did when I got outside? I ain't taking that junk. I threw it in the corner. I said, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to do what I know to do is right, and God's going to heal me. And guess what happened? You, are, you already know. I ain't even got to say nothing. Amen. <laughs> And I've heard it said like this. See, some of y'all need to get this in your spirit. Amen. You need to get, stop leaving things up to chance. Stop leaving things to everybody else. Stop trusting these stinking doctors so much. Put your faith, put your trust, put your hope in God. Because guess what? You do your best. Amen. And guess what? Who's going to do the rest? God's going to do the rest. You got to put your faith in him. So guess what? I'm going to do everything I need to do, and if I die, I just die. Because guess what? You're not going to get out of this world alive anyway. (laughs) So I love that story about the three Hebrew boys. Y'all know that? They ain't even boy. They were men. But Ananias, Hazariah, and Mishael, they all went to the king, and they said, we're going to kill you because you didn't do what we said do. We're going to throw you in the lion's den, and we're going mean, to throw you in the fiery furnace because you didn't do what we said. And Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael stood before the king. Were they scared? Did they say, we're going to bow down to the image and worship the image? They said, no. And you know what? That's a picture of things to come. Because you can believe what you want to believe. But the, that book says that in the last days, there's going to be some kind of mark. Now, you can do what you want to do. 
But it said, if you don't have that mark, now, I don't, do you, what's the mark, preacher? I don't know. To be honest with you, I don't care. Because if you're a true believer, you're going to know what it is. And guess what? That's going to be all kind of church folks lining up to take the mark. He said, well, God understands and God knows. And, and. No, he said, don't take it. Just like in the days of Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which y'all, which y'all know them as. But, but their biblical name, or they, their Hebrew names was that. But anyway, when they were there, they told them to bow down and worship the image, and they said no. My thing is, is Reba, who was watching? Because if you're supposed to be worshiping the image too, how you see them not worshiping the image? Somebody was, they was peeking. <laughs> oh, them dudes ain't worshiping. Anyway. And then they had to stand before the king. The king said, we're going to give you one last, ain't that like the devil? I'm going to give you one last chance to bow before everybody. It was like, you know what? <laughs> you, you just got to throw us in the furnace. The God we serve is able to deliver us. And I love the last part, Mike. They say, even if he don't, you better know one thing, that we're not going to bow before your image. And they threw him in the fiery furnace, and guess what? Jesus was with him. So you need to understand one thing, that Jesus needs to be with you. Amen. He's no figurine you wear around your neck. It's not just a bumper sticker. It's a life that you live. And everywhere you go, you understand that the Lord is walking by my side, even in Walmart when I see the pastor there. Right. Right. <laughs> Amen. You say, preacher, that bothers you a lot, don't it? Yeah. Because how you going to, you, if you're my brother and sister, how you act like you don't know me? That's a problem to me. Really? Amen. So patience teaches me how to trust in God. So you pray. You wait, but again, the most powerful thing is your expectation. Matthew 21, verse 22. And whatever things that you ask in prayer, believing you will receive them, you will receive. But everything you ask. See, if you're not looking for it, you don't believe too much. Amen. Amen. So y'all talking about patience. Patience is something that we all need. But again, don't pray for it. Just let it happen. Or pray like this. Say, God, give me according to what I need. Amen. Let's pray. Father, right now.